is the news leader, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. And good evening at 6 o'clock. I'm Bill Ritter. And I'm Liz Cho. We begin tonight with breaking news. Tonight there is an even worsening situation in Iraq. And in just the past hour, ABC News is confirming at least 12 U.S. Marines were killed in new fighting near the city of Ramadi. Reports say dozens of Iraqis attacked a Marine position near the governor's residence in that city. 22 Marines were also wounded in the shootout. That news comes as heavy fighting continues near the northern city of Fallujah. Eight U.S. service members have died in clashes there and in Baghdad since yesterday. U.S. forces are attempting to rout out Iraqi militia. ABC News, ABC News and World News Tonight will have much more on this developing story coming up at 6.30. We have more breaking news, this time here at home. The dry conditions and winds outside whipping up several brush fires across the region. One of them we're following is burning right now in Newark along the turnpike. Shannon Sohn in Newscopter 7 right above it. Shannon? Yeah, and it has been a tough day today for firefighters. The problem here in Newark is that the fire department having a difficult time accessing this area. As you can see up on the top of your screen, this is Route 21, and they have shut down the ramp from the southbound side of Route 21 to Route 78. That is so that they can try and get some fire department vehicles into this area. This is an area that is surrounded by railroad tracks, and it's making it difficult for the fire department to get to it. But the high winds and the dry conditions not making things good here. In fact, what we're going to do is bring you south of 78 towards Newark Airport, and you'll see little pockets of smoke along the railroad tracks. That is because all of these little timbers are just kind of branching off, and as they blow off, they start little fires along the way. So a very grave situation here, and this is not the only brush fire today. We've seen them in Queens, in Brooklyn, and in Staten Island as well. Reporting live over Newark, Shannon Stone, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Shannon, thank you. Sam will have more on how long we expect the winds to last a little later. A development tonight in the suicide of a local man whose suicide was caught on surveillance video. Tonight, sources telling Eyewitness News that police are a step closer to figuring out how that video from an NYPD surveillance camera ended up on an internet porn site. Now, we first showed you this video last week. Marcus Solis here now with today's developments. Marcus? Well, Bill, anyone who's gotten a chain email knows that messages, jokes, games can spread like wildfire on the internet. Investigators trying to track down who leaked video of a man committing suicide are learning the clip was distributed more than they originally thought. The investigation started last week, shortly after this video appeared on the Internet. 22-year-old Paris Lane committed suicide in the Mars houses last month. The images were captured by surveillance cameras installed as part of the NYPD's Viper program at certain public housing developments. The owner of the Atlanta-based adult website where it appeared says he's told investigators what little he knows. We have IP addresses and an email address, and we've given those to the police, and that's it. You know, 300,000 people a day come to the site. There's no way for us to know every single person and what they send. That information has led to Long Island, where Suffolk County police confirm an officer there has been questioned. The cop told investigators he was emailed a copy by a friend. NYPD sources would only say it appears the clip was copied and forwarded several times. But for now, the source of the leak has not been identified, and a family continues to suffer. They don't know what they did. They put that tape for a lie. They traumatized a lot of the kids. They don't know what they did. Well, Paris Lane's family is suing the city. The website has been ordered to remove the video since it is property of the NYPD. The department's internal affairs unit is conducting the investigation. Liz? Marcus, thank you. Police in Brooklyn are searching for two men wanted for raping two women Saturday night. Police say the attackers followed the women home, forcing them into the vestibule of one of their apartments and assaulted them. The first suspect is described as an Hispanic male, 25 to 30 years old, 5 foot 3, weighing about 160 pounds. The second man is described as 26 to 30 years old, 5 foot 9 inches tall, weighing 175 pounds. There's a break tonight in the case of a missing West Hampton Beach mother. 23-year-old Faustino Chavez is under arrest and charged with arre uh, arson for torching Vanessa Hoera's Toyota Camry. Hoera disappeared on February 27th after she left her family's seafood store in West Hampton Beach, where she and Chavez were co-workers. I really thought it would answer some questions if uh, he would have been able to cooperate and help us tell us where she is so that we could start climbing out of this hole. Police are not yet saying what, if any, role Chavez may have played in 
Vanessa's disappearance. There are big problems tonight at the new Essex County Jail in Newark. Two inmates have died and families say the facility is so disorganized they cannot visit prisoners. The problem, nearly two dozen guards calling in sick every day with what officials describe as a case of the blue flu. Jen Maxfield has a story. The Essex County Corrections officers who did show up for work this afternoon say they're walking into a hornet's nest, the new jail where neither the guards nor the inmates are satisfied. We've had situations where inmates were bailed out a week ago and they're still locked up because the, the entire uh, computer classification system broke down. It's, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. It took Essex County just two days to move 2,000 inmates into this new facility. Corrections officers say if the move had happened more gradually, they would have had some time to work out some of the kinks in the system. While some problems have been resolved, corrections officers report the jail's phone system is flawed, visiting hours are sporadically suspended, and some inmates' personal property is missing. I'm missing a $700 leather jacket, my gold chain, the owner rights to my car, my registration, the driver's license, um, a pair of keys. Essex County blames the setbacks on an outbreak of the blue flu. The levels of absenteeism and the levels of what we call AWOL, okay, um, are extraordinary. Essex County officials believe corrections officers are staying home sick in retaliation for the layoffs of 150 of their own. As the new jail opening got closer, records show sick days went up from 1,800 in the last quarter of 2003 to 3,500 in the first quarter of 2004. If the current rate of sick days keeps up, there will be 4,200 in the next three months. Corrections officers insist this is not a coordinated protest. Most of the time the guys are calling in is for exhaustion and the fact that they stressed out from doing all those hours. Essex County has rehired 35 corrections officers to fill the empty shifts, and the corrections officers' unions have asked the state to take over control of the new jail. In Newark, New Jersey, Jen Maxfield, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Funeral services going on right now for a toddler who was shot and killed last week in Brooklyn. A wake held today for two-year-old Dimani Spruill. He was shot in the head as he was sitting in a car with his family in the Brownsville section. Gunman also shot his father. His brother and sister were also slightly hurt. So far, no one has been arrested for that shooting. We're going to switch gears now because the University of Connecticut tonight on the verge of making sports history. If the women's basketball team wins tonight, UConn will become the first college team to win the men's and women's NCAA championship. The men, of course, winning last night. Joe Torres with the story. He is in stores, Connecticut, for us. Joe? Bill, one crown, one to go. That's the way one local newspaper put it. We're live here at the University of Connecticut inside the Gamble Pavilion where we're just moments away from the start of a pep rally for the men's basketball team after their illustrious victory last night. They arrived here back from San Antonio about 90 minutes ago and all the fans that have gathered here for the pep rally, they will stay afterwards and then watch the women's team play. And the hope is that after last night, it'll be a joyous victory followed by an orderly celebration. They're back inside Gample Pavilion. Students return this afternoon to the men's basketball team's home court, ready for a pep rally tonight, congratulating the squad on its national championship victory. 7,000 students filled the pavilion last night as they watched the game on four giant TV screens. You couldn't even sit down and watch the game. Everyone was standing up. You had no choice but to get into the momentum. It was, it was unbelievable. It's unreal. Isn't it? it was unbelievable. Ridiculous. It was, it was a great time. Can't ask for more. Freshman year, championship right off the bat. <laughs> oh, amazing was the post-game mayhem. University and Connecticut State Police arrested 35 people after students set two dozen fires, overturned four cars, and just basically got out of control. Police were spraying tear gas. So, I mean, I left. Was it getting out of hand? I mean, it was yeah, there was fires and... Hopefully it won't get out of, uh, out of hand tonight, but um, I'm pretty confident in my students that they'll be okay. Back live inside the Gamble Pavilion here on the University of Connecticut Stores campus. You can see the podium, the introductions just getting underway for this pep rally. The police will be out in full force, and they want everyone to know that. Connecticut State Police helping the University Police to make sure things do not get out of hand tonight. They don't want to see a repeat of the violent and destructive behavior that they saw last night, and so they hope to celebrate a big victory. 
team getting ready to come out. We'll have live pictures for you in sports and then a complete wrap-up tonight on Eyewitness News at 11 o'clock. For now, we're live at Stores. I'm Joe Torres, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. We hope they win. We Go. hope the celebrations are peaceful. Go Huskies. Go yes, Huskies. Indeed. All right, just ahead, it is a battle over green. Coming up, a bureaucratic decision that could dramatically cut the number of trees planted this spring in New York City, and those that are planted will cost you taxpayers more. And in tonight's Extra, how some video games could make your doctor a better surgeon. It's tonight's Extra, and it is coming up soon. Tonight, should women be denied birth control because of their pharmacist's personal beliefs? I said, oh, I said, is there something wrong with the prescription? Could your state soon make this legal? Watch World News Tonight. Tomorrow on Eyewitnesses this morning, some South Bronx middle schoolers score big in the classroom. But it's their success in the music room that has everybody talking. Watch Eyewitness News this morning, tomorrow morning, starting at 5 a.m. Feel the power of Eyewitness News at your fingertips with a 7 Online Desktop Alert. Instantly, you'll be notified of breaking news and bad weather. In your home, on your computer. Click on to 7 Online and sign up for the 7 Online Desktop Alert today. The new spring drip. Well, you are looking at live pictures right now of one of several brush fires that are currently burning in our area. This one is in Newark. Shannon Stone is in News Copter 7 with an update. Shannon, what can you tell us? Yeah, Liz, this is right at the intersection of Route 21 and Route 78, just on the north side of 78 there. Now, this has been burning for the better part of 20 minutes or so, and the fire department has yet to be able to get to these fires. If you see on the left side of your screen, there are railroad tracks here, and this is just impeding the police. These are the first police officers and fire department that we have seen on the scene of some of these spin-off fires. It has just been a messy afternoon with high winds and low humidity. Reporting live over Newark, Shannon Stone, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Looking for a tough commuter as well. Thank you, Shannon. This figures to be a tough year for trees in New York City. Hundreds fewer will be planted in the city this spring. The trees and the New Yorkers who depend on them for shade caught in something of a bureaucratic squabble. Getting to the root of the problem for us Political reporter Dave Evans. A spot of color amidst the concrete is Gail Hirsch's passion. And a tree line 95th Street is what she dreams about. They make people feel better. They, they're, they're not concrete. You know, they're, they're green, they flower, they smell beautiful. Um, I think it really enhances the quality of life. But two ash trees on her block are dying, victim to a small worm-like insect. The city had planned on replacing them this spring. But a fight over union work rules may mean less money, fewer trees, and Manhattan is taking the brunt of it. The Parks Department will probably not plant a single tree in Manhattan this spring. Last summer, the city controller decided union contract rules prohibit gardeners from doing extensive city landscaping. Instead, he ruled the city must employ laborers. Gardeners make about $14 an hour, laborers $47 an hour. That difference in cost means fewer trees planted this spring. But this is really gardening. It's, it's, what our, it's what our gardeners do, and it's, it's what people do at home when they plant a tree. It's not heavy construction. The mayor's park commissioner says the ruling means a 33% cut to his tree budget. The controller says it's unfortunate that the parks department is looking to pit people earning a fair wage against planting trees. The city should continue to plant trees while paying people what they deserve. For New Yorkers like Gail Hirsch, the fight means a big loss for her neighborhood. What this means to us is that we, we will have to be dealing with a dead tree. Late today, city council members called saying they'll try to work out some kind of a compromise. If they don't, it could be serious. Every year, New York City loses about 7,000 trees. The Parks Department says it can afford to plant only 6,000 this year. So over time, the effect could be a city that's less and less green. Dave Evans, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. We do not need that. No, we don't. Just ahead, games, games that save lives. How playing certain video games could make your doctor a better surgeon. It's tonight's Extra, and it is coming up next. The gusty winds and dry air today feeding those fires around the region. We'll talk about that and your forecast. It's on its way. An all-new Oprah. She knows she's in trouble. I'll pick two when I wake up. 15 minutes later, I take another one. Mom's addicted to drugs. Come clean. 
I'm going to call you after you get home. Next, Oprah. Tomorrow at 4, right here on ABC7. You're watching Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Nobody asks tougher questions, digs deeper, and uncovers more of the real story. Nobody covers your news like Eyewitness News. Nobody. Tonight we are taking a look at a cutting-edge way to train surgeons. With laparoscopic surgery becoming increasingly popular, some doctors now find themselves relying more on a joystick than on traditional instruments. So many are now honing their skills on specially made video games. With tonight's Extra, here's Art McFarlane. The video games children play, like these at the ESPN Zone, are more high-tech and sophisticated than ever. It's fun, it keeps you thinking, moving, it's uh, challenging. And some of these kids could become the surgeons of tomorrow. In fact, some of the surgeons of today are using video games to help prepare for what's known as non-invasive laparoscopic surgery. You depend on a video camera and tiny incisions and long, thin instruments to help you manipulate tissues to achieve surgical procedures. Doctors admit that, yes, this is fun, and of course, it is games. But we're told there's a direct relationship between surgical skill and the ability to play these games. Basically, for every laparoscopic case that I do, it's easier and faster, I think, because of what I've done uh, with video games. Beth Israel Hospital has released the results of a study last summer in which both younger and older, more established doctors were tested playing video games like this racing simulation based on the Star Wars movies and then asked to perform simulated laparoscopic surgery. There was an overwhelming association and that the surgeons who played video games, especially those who played greater than three hours a day as children growing up, were overwhelmingly better at laparoscopic suturing skills. Dr. James Rosser heads Beth Israel's high-tech surgery unit. He says procedures like this amount to the future of most surgery until someday surgery is more like Star Wars. So I have hope that all these kids out there playing video games are going to be a recruiting class of the Jedis of the 21st century of surgery, surgical health care. Most parents do not want their kids to spend too much time doing this, but who knows where the video games could lead. Art McFarland, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. All the kids are not going to say, Mom, I'm practicing to be right. a doctor. <laughs> every one of them. Every one of them now have an excuse. Very cool, though. Yeah. All right, so the big question tonight is, when is this wind going to die down? It takes time. We're still breezy tomorrow. I mean, it's incrementally dropping down. Yesterday, we were 47, 48 miles per hour at a peak gust. Today, we're 37, 38 miles per hour. Tomorrow, 27, 28 miles per hour. But the gusty winds and the dry air, anything that goes around this area in a brush fire, really really get spread around and these guys are going to have a hard time fighting them even if they can get to some of those brush areas quickly those things are still going to be running and burning we've got dry clear skies outside our picture there from high atop the abc super studios looking across to the south and those wind gusts are anywhere from 32 39 to 40 miles per hour at kennedy airport today 39 in newark 38 toward islip it's gusty everywhere numbers right now 53 degrees relative humidity this is another thing 14 percent so very dry air and remember we're talking talking about the brush that hasn't even sprouted yet. So it's exactly what you would use to start a fire is the little dry, tender limbs. And that's exactly what's going out there now. Anywhere northwestern winds from 12 to 24 miles per hour this hour. 54 degrees, the top number on the day. 34, 35 degrees is low temperatures in the Hudson Valley. 42 in Newark. This represents a big jump over this morning. Start temperatures of 14, 15 degrees in northern areas. Look at that, picking up 20 degrees for your start temperature tomorrow. So much more comfortable. Still, you know, you would call this a little chill in the air, but not that brutal cold feeling that you got up to this morning. High temperatures really do increase tomorrow because of afternoon sunshine. I think there'll be a moment overnight tonight and early in the morning where we have some clouds and probably a little sprinkle right around daybreak, but 57 to 62 degrees in southern areas with those numbers that high temperatures are really coming up to where they should be this time of year. Here's that bit of moisture that makes a run through the area. It's a quick moving, you could call it a clipper-like low that really doesn't have much action with it, but it does bring some clouds in. So in the next couple of hours, you'll notice those getting in. Sprinkles, if you were gonna time them, I'd call them right about six, seven o'clock in the morning. So mostly cloudy with a late night shower, 
40 degrees, and it's just a sprinkle, and it's right first thing in the morning. Early clouds, breezy clearing in the afternoon. The sunshine will take you to 58 degrees, and many locations will take you to 60. Mostly clear skies, 42 degrees on tomorrow night, and the five-day offers up a completely different week from last week. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are forecast days, and still Thursday night system is just a little bit of drizzle as well. No big rainmakers. All okay. right, good. Thanks, Thanks Sam. Scott is up next with sports. It's opening day again. <laughs> Coming up on Eyewitness News, the Mets get set to take on the Braves in their season debut. Plus, we're going to go live inside the Gamble Pavilion. There we are, home of the national champion Yukon Huskies. It's a celebration. Next. Stay tuned to ABC7, starting at 8 with 8 Simple Rules. Then, I with her. According to Jim, it's all relative. NYPD Blue. Then at 11, I with this news. All right here on ABC7. Tonight's preview is sponsored by 42nd Street. We're the biggest show on Broadway. We're in the body. We're in the body. She was a beauty, but her nose needed help. Allergies? was so much out there that could get a nose in trouble. It was a case for Flonase. Only Flonase is approved to treat nasal symptoms from indoor and outdoor allergies, as well as year-round non-allergic nasal symptoms that can feel like allergies. No kidding. For best results, use daily. Side effects are generally mild and may include headache, nosebleed, and sore throat. Whether it's the usual allergy suspects or environmental offenders, talk to your doctor. All it takes is Flonase. Now, don't get nervous, but it may take Mom a little while to, you know, warm up to you. Mom. Honey. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Mom, I would like you to meet my girlfriend. Great Jen. skirt. Thanks. TJ Maxx, 17 bucks. <gasps> really? <laughs> yeah, got these sandals there, too. I just got a lamp there for a steal, you want to see? Yeah. <clears throat> great friends, great prices. For spring, TJ Maxx. You should go. Post captioning provided by your Lexus dealers. I have clients who were born with a do-it-yourself gene. These are people who can fix a computer, wire a ceiling fan, make a VCR stop blinking. For them, H&R Block has a website where they can do their own taxes online. And if they have any tax problems, they can call or email a tax pro, someone like me, for whatever help they need. How do you make a VCR stop blinking? Taxes and advice online. Another advantage of H&R Block. Happy Passover to you and those you love from ABC7. In Massachusetts, you'll find all the things that make taking a getaway worthwhile. So make it here and then make it yours. To find the getaway that's right for you, click on MassVacation.com or call 1-800-552-MASS. When last we checked into that Newark fire, there were no fire department firefighters on the scene. Shannon, has the fire department arrived yet? Yeah, things are finally starting to change here, Bill, slowly, very slowly. You can see pockets of fire still burning, but we want to bring you down towards the bottom of your screen. This is towards 78, and you can see several fire department vehicles now on the scene here. They are trying very hard to get here, but between 78 and 21 is elevated roadways through this area, and really the only access to it. It's difficult to get to it. Railroad tracks making it even harder, but it looks like they're getting the upper hand. Reporting live over Newark, Shannon Stone, Channel 7. Eyewitness News. All right. Thank you, Shed. Big night in sports tonight. Let's get right to Another it. opening day. Let's get this party started. The Mets are ready to go in Atlanta tonight to kick off the 2004 season by taking on the Braves in Atlanta. And that's where Geneva Brew joins us live right now. Geneva. Scott, it's fitting that the Mets open the season against the Braves, the perennial division winners, 12 years running, because New York knows that the road to the National League pennant goes through Atlanta, and the journey begins here tonight. Expectations for the 2004 Mets are simple. Looking for better things. Art Howe isn't looking for excuses because the Mets are starting the season without their star second baseman, Jose Reyes. He wants the focus to be on defense and pitching. 
The focus is also on new players and old players in new positions. It's not easy to completely transform a club overnight or even in an off season, but we've added some some in some elements that we needed to some weaknesses that we needed to address. So, you know, time will tell. It's a long year. 162 games beginning tonight in Atlanta, home of former Brave and Game One starter Tom Glavin. Pitching well against these guys is something that I have to improve upon from last year, and, and pitching well in general. Now, an update on Al Leiter, who took a line drive to the head a few days ago. He's expected to make his first start of the season this Saturday, which is the same day that Reyes is expected to come off the disabled list. We'll be back here at 11 with post-game reaction for Now Live in Atlanta. I'm Geneva Braves. Channel 7, I will see you. All right. Thank you, Geneva. As for the Yankees, shall we try this again? It's the Yankees and the Devil Rays again, one week to the day after they open the season up in Japan. Now with a rematch of the opening day pitchers, Mike Bucina versus Victor Zambrano. Mussina was on the losing end of that opener. He took a 3-2 lead into the sixth inning, but gave up three runs in that frame and took the loss. So they'll set the Moose loose again tonight. And, and Moose, you know, I know he, he wants to get back out there and, and have a good outing, and then hopefully we can, uh, we can play well the next couple of days. We're ready to. All right. Hail to the victors. The Yukon Huskies are the NCAA college basketball champions. We take you live right now to Gampo Pavilion or Gampel Pavilion, depending on the, how you want to pronounce it. Either or is fine. It's full of Huskies fans paying tribute to Jim Calhoun and crew in a celebration yeah, rally. This is Talik Brown. Um, it's just been long four, it was a long four years, you know, we went through a lot of hard work, we did a lot, and we just couldn't do it without y'all, we appreciate everything y'all brought to us, and every game y'all came to, and just thank you for everything, we love y'all. All right, Talik Brown, the Huskies earned their second national title in six seasons by dominating Georgia Tech, the final was 82-73, but it wasn't even that close, as UConn prevails once more. I don't think it's hit me yet. I'm kind of all right. I want to practice tomorrow. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I just, it hasn't quite sunk in that, you know, the season's over, that we, 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 we've done what we, we wanted to do, and you know, I'm still kind of, I'm in awe still. And tonight, the UConn women go after the women's title against Tennessee, a team Diana Taurasi and company beat last year for their second straight championship. They've won their last five meetings against Tennessee. I look to do it again in Tarasi's final game tonight. Our last chance to kind of go out there and, and put, you know, the Connecticut jersey on, uh, it means a lot to us. And, um, you know, when you're playing for a national championship, that's all you can ask for. UConn, indeed, chasing history. It will be the first time in a single year that both teams, women, yep. men and women, win the national championship in college basketball. I'm Scott Clark. That's it for sports. And this raging debate over how to pronounce the auditorium, you say... Gampel. Gampel. In Connecticut, all the people in Connecticut say right. it's Gampel Pavilion, but family the family it called Gampel. it Gampel because the Gampel family yeah. contributed to the pavilion. <laughs> yes. So I think we'll call it Gampel, Gampel. <laughs> for them. <laughs> Peter it. Jennings is up next. We'll see you back here at 11 o'clock. Good night. On World News tonight, a very bad day for the U.S. in Iraq. U.S. forces caught off guard by the intense...